Howard knew about nine manuscripts of Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew, and I've compiled a list of 28. And the last one I opened has Shera'u, that they saw. And then above the line, somebody wrote Shela'agu, that they mocked. <laughs>Welcome, my friends, to Hebrew Gospel Pearls, Episode 5. We are continuing in Matthew Chapter 2. We're now moving on to Chapter 2, verses 16 to 23. And uh, I'm here with Nehemiah Gordon, who is in the zone. <laughs> we couldn't even wait to do this one. This one, he, he tells me, and, and folks, I want to tell you something. He wouldn't tell me what it is, but it's a game changer. <laughs> Nehemiah, what are you talking about? What, what do you mean, game changer? Where are we at here? Uh, well, what? I kind of stumbled upon something in Matthew 2.23. There's the verse where it says he will be called the Nazarene. Let's read it. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. And there's no such verse in the Tanakh. You're going to think I found it. You're literally going to jump to the end? No, no, we'll, I'm not. We'll do it in due course, but I think I found <laughs> the verse that he's quoting um, in the Tanakh. And, and look, I, you know, we, we talked in the, in the last program, Keith, about how uh, there's different approaches to the New Testament, and one is the anti-missionary approach. Mm -hmm. And what they want to do is, of course, you know, anti-missionaries are Jews who say, hey, you target us as Jews, you missionaries, we want to counter that message. And the anti-missionary approach or the counter-missionary approach wants to find all the problems in Matthew and in the New Testament and show why it's not valid. And one of the things they'll do is in this verse, Matthew 2, 23, they'll say, hey, the New Testament quoted a phantom verse. The verse doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. How can you trust this book? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I found the verse, but we'll have to save that for when we get to that verse later in the, in the program. <laughs> oh, well, let's back up then. <laughs> We're looking at 16. Uh, we've yeah. gone through Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 2. We're at 16. And yeah. if I can read it in English, if that would be okay. Right. And then I yeah. want you to you to do your thing. I mean, it, I'm I'm pretty excited about this. It says that when Herod saw that he had been in uh, tricked in my English Bible, tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in the. Uh, it says here it, it's it's environs uh, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had uh, ascertained from the Magi. Before I have you comment, I want to ask a, a simple mm. question. In the Hebrew Gospel, Matthew, when it opens up and it says, and then Herod saw that he was, and there's a, there's a word there. And I think what Howard does is Howard says uh, he was mocked. Uh, I don't know if oh, you got a chance to even this look at is, this. This, this is, is a really important issue here, Keith. <laughs> so, so, all right. Now, here we're going to get to delve into some really hardcore textual criticism yes. of, the, of the text of Hebrew Matthew. Mm-hmm. Uh, in other words, we have all these different manuscripts, and here I actually did something where I, and I didn't do this in every case yet, it's it's an ongoing process. So like I said, they'll have to be Hebrew Gospel Pearl Season 2. <laughs> but, but for this one, I, I was able to go through every single manuscript and check to see exactly what it says in that verse. Stop one second. Yeah. Stop one second. Nehemiah, did I ahead of time call you and say, look at this? I did not. No. You did not. You, did you call and no, tell me? No, this jumped off the page. What are you talking no, about? But here, what, no, but here, no, here, no, wait. I want to. I had to look at this. No, folks, I, I want to stop for a second, Hemi, because I mean, again, mm -hmm. it, here's the process that we're in. We're both looking at the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, and you've got these 28 manuscripts, which to me is a treasure trove of information, inspiration, and many revelations, pearls that come off it. But isn't it interesting? We're reading here, and this jumps off the page to both of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just telling you, I mean, it's like when you're reading Hebrew Gospel from Matthew, there's certain things that literally jump off the page. And so that's why I want to say this to our folks that are listening, people that are listening. If you're if you want to go deeper into study, you've got an opportunity to go to the plus sections and you can actually download a PDF that has the Hebrew word and then the English uh, equivalent. It's called our interlinear that you can use. And we're already finding the I mean, great news. We're already finding people that are doing this. And they're having the kind of revelations that we're having. So the pearls process wow. is spreading amongst people all over. Now, go ahead and go into wow. this because it's it's exciting. All right. So uh, it, it, let's actually start with the Greek here, okay? Yes. So, or the English translation of the Greek. The, the, the Greek has the word Matthew 2, 16. Mm -hmm. The Greek has the word um, 
and a peich thay, which is translated in the NRSV is tr- as tricked. Mm-hmm. Dalich translates hetelu, mm-hmm. which is they deceived. Yes. That's the Hebrew translation of the Greek, mm-hmm. hetelu. Mm-hmm. Uh, and interestingly, Ginsburg, uh, Salkinson and Ginsburg also have the exact same word, hetelu. Uh, it leads me to the conclusion that uh, Salkinson and Ginsburg uh, and Dalich were, um, uh, I guess Ginsburg came later. So Ginsburg was consulting Dalich's translation mm-hmm. into the Hebrew mm-hmm. and using that as the basis for his translation, which is very common. Mm-hmm. When people translate today into English, they'll usually start with something like the King James, mm-hmm. and they'll say, well, no, it got it wrong here. We have to change this. We have to change that. But they usually don't start with a blank slate, which is why you compare these different translations and they're so similar. And sometimes they're all wrong. <laughs> um, and I'm talking about the translation of the Hebrew into English, but here it's the Greek into Hebrew of Dalich mm-hmm. and Ginsburg. Okay, I'm not saying it's wrong here. It's just saying they deceived, they tricked is two different possible interpretations of the Greek. Mm-hmm. Um, the King James has mocked. Yes. Which from what I looked in the Greek dictionary is definitely a possibility. Now, here's where the controversy comes in. In the British Library manuscript uh, of Hebrew Matthew, and eight under eight other manuscripts, so nine of twenty-four surviving manuscripts in this section, right? We have twenty-eight total manuscripts of Hebrew Matthew, but those twenty-eight manuscripts don't cover all of Hebrew Matthew. Some are a fragment of one chapter, mm-hmm. uh, or two of them in particular, are a ch- uh, fragments of part of chapter one. So twenty-four manuscripts survive on this verse, on this passage. Hmm. Nine of the 24 have, they saw him, mm-hmm. which makes absolutely no sense, and which is why Howard did what he did. Um, in other words, let, let's read it the way uh, the British Library and eight other manuscripts have it. Then Herod saw that the astrologers, or the, however, the Magi saw him. Mm-hmm. Then Herod saw that the Magi saw him, and it was bad for him, and his heart was saddened. Mm -hmm. Herod saw that the Magi saw him. What does that mean? And what it could mean is that he saw that they saw his intentions. That's one possibility. Well, can I tell you what what I did when I I saw it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Immediately when I saw that phrase, I went to this, this, the thought that when Herod saw that they saw him, meaning like they exposed him, meaning they, they, they found out his, they found out what it was that he was doing. So that's, yeah, they they thought they saw what he was about, what he was after. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and that's definitely the meaning of the Hebrew in these nine manuscripts of Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. Hmm. However, there are seven other manuscripts that instead of they saw him, it says, Sherimu, that they deceived him. Oh. Now, <laughs> here's the fascinating thing. The two words they saw and they deceived, those are tricked, really. They saw and they, they tricked or deceived. Those, the difference is one letter in Hebrew. One is Resh Mem Vav, and the other is Resh Aleph Vav. And in the writing of the Middle Ages, <laughs> especially the semi-cursive, the <laughs> Aleph and the Mem are virtually identical. Ask me, I know. <laughs> now, yeah. Now, I think you can come to no other conclusion that they saw and they deceived started with a single reading, and one of those Resh Mem Vav and Resh Aleph Vav, one is an error for the other. In other words, we have a definitive error here in Hebrew Matthew, along with the original reading of Hebrew Matthew, right? Right. Um, which one is the original and which is the error? Uh, I think you'd probably, I'd be inclined to think that Rimu, they deceived, mm-hmm. is the original because it's closer to the Greek. But here I'm, I guess I'm revealing a Greek bias, right? They saw is also possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you think about that? I uh, like they saw. <laughs> and okay. here's and now, I'll tell you why. Yeah. I, I want to tell you why. And it really goes back to something that you exposed me to years and years ago. Um, and, and it has to do with when you're reading in Hebrew, when you find mm-hmm. words that are similar or words that have that, that mm-hmm. they are similar, but may have a different meaning or a slightly different meaning. So when I was reading in Hebrew and I saw uh, the word that when he saw that they saw, I immediately thought, oh, that makes sense. He saw that they saw him. They exposed. So there could him. be a sort of play on words. Play here on in words. The Hebrew. That's, that's what happened okay. for me. But I love the Definitely fact that you, possible. you check these other uh, manuscripts. And folks, I want right. to stop and tell you something. This is this is this is the key, Nehemiah, and uh, I I don't mind saying this. Um, this is the key uh, uh, of the uh, what I would call the legitimacy of this process. Having those twenty-eight manuscripts, and more than that, having you being able to go in to compare and to contrast. 
How exciting is that? I mean, that's the thing that made you go, <laughs> this study is based just, on all of the manuscripts. Yeah. So this is I, pretty exciting. I, I just want to put this in context. Mm. So these manuscripts are handwritten, right? Yes. They're handwritten. They're photographs. In order to find something in them, it's a painstaking process of going through and looking and, mm -hmm. you know, you open up the image, you're like, oh, no, that's a later chapter. Now let's find this page. So let's say conservatively, it takes about 15 minutes per manuscript mm -hmm. and there's 24. That's six hours of solid work mm -hmm. for one word. <laughs> but that's what's required. I mean, that's the process that's required to, to really get to the bottom of this. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not done with the story. It gets more exciting. <laughs> exactly. So we have nine manuscripts that say they saw, seven manuscripts say they deceived, difference of one single letter in Hebrew, a letter that's graphically similar, right? Aleph and Mem in this type of script are almost identical. One is definitely an error for the other. Which one, you know, it, both are both, who knows, right? Mm -hmm. It's hard to say which is original. Probably, I'm like I said, I gravitate towards the Greek. Here's the really exciting thing. There's seven more manuscripts, Keith, <laughs> where it says a completely different word, shela'agu. Doesn't look similar, is not graphically similar, <laughs> completely different word, and it means they mocked him. <laughs> so there's no question whatsoever, definitively, somebody came along and saw the word shera'u, they saw and said, well, that doesn't make sense, and that's not what's in the Greek. So they replaced it with a different word that means they mocked him mm. based on the Greek or maybe the Latin. Wow. The Latin has inlesis, which is mocked. Wow. So, so this is a, it's beautiful what happened here. Mm. We have, uh, I mean, it's a beautiful example mm. of textual criticism where you look at all the manuscripts to try to get what really happened here. Mm -hmm. w w there, this is, there's a smoking gun here. Mm. And I actually have the smoking, smoking gun that I'll get to in a minute. <laughs> so we have the original reading, which is either they saw or they deceived. Take your pick. Uh, Somebody came along and saw the word they saw, in Hebrew it's one word, and he said, that's not right, that's not what's in the Greek, and he replaced it with a completely different word, it doesn't even sound similar, isn't written similarly, shalagu, that means they mocked based on the Greek. Clear as day, mm -hmm. from 23 manuscripts, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. And then I opened the 24th manuscript, Keith, and the 24th manuscript, and this is, this is not a manuscript Howard knew about, this is one of the what? ones that I, I discovered. Wait, wait, wait. One of the... Stop, stop. Yeah. You, you, before you tell us about this, what do you mean he didn't know about it? This is Ma this. Uh, Howard knew about nine manuscripts of Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew. Right. And I've compiled a list of 28. Yes. And the last one I opened has Shera'u, that they saw. And then above the line, somebody wrote Shela'agu, that they mocked. <laughs> stop so, the presses. <laughs> this is incredible. So we were able to put together from 23 manuscripts the steps that must have happened. It originally wrote they deceived. There's a mistake that says they saw, or at least somebody perceived that as a mistake. And in other words, maybe originally it said they saw, and somebody said, that's not right. And they changed it to they deceived, thinking, oh, Aleph, Mem, they're, they're similar. This must be a mistake. So they corrected the mistake. Mm. Okay. So that's a those are two possibilities. They saw, they deceived. And then we hypothesized that, that when they wrote, they mocked him, that was somebody correcting they saw, right? And then we actually found the manuscript where that took place. This is unbelievable. And, and you In know, textual criticism, you can't hope to have something like this. this, this like, where we actually found the manuscript where the shift took place, the scribe went in and changed it. Yeah, okay. it's, it's incredible. I, so this is a manuscript I'm going to be paying very close attention to. This is a manuscript that um, this is a manuscript that years ago I ordered color photographs of, and because uh, in the black and white photographs it's very difficult to read. Mm. What they did is they took this um, what I call rice paper, but it's actually called Japanese paper. It's a very thin film, mm -hmm. and they put it over the ink to, so the ink wouldn't flake off. Well, now we come a hundred years later and we can't read it because the ink is absorbed into the Japanese paper. Mm -hmm. And at least in black and white, you can't read it. Uh, in the color, I was able to you know, read it pretty clearly. Which library, in the family? More... What's that? Which library? That will be revealed in due time. It's a library <laughs> in Italy, I can say that. <laughs> um, this uh, <laughs> set of photographs cost, um, let's just say an arm and a leg. The Italians are They'll, they'll give you the color photographs. Some, some libraries won't give you the color photographs. Mm -hmm. The Italians will do it, but they charge you a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And then they say, we don't want to photograph just a few pages. We want to photograph the entire manuscript. Well, mm -hmm. 
Shem Tov's Hebrew Matthew is, let's say it's 30 or, or 60 pages, depending on how it's laid out, mm -hmm. in a manuscript of 300 pages. So I had to pay for the 300 pages. <laughs> and if I remember correctly, it was 15 euros a page. So that was something like 4,500 euros to get these color images. Yeah. Wow. Unbelievable. <sighs> And, and I've had these for, for years now, um, but I'm able to study them now and, and, and discover things that Howard didn't know about it. So it was worth every penny. Okay, let's go on uh, if we can. Um, so he became very enraged and he sent and yeah. slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem in the, in, in, in the area, in the in, environs, it says. But then there, yeah. there's this phrase, and this is what the English does for us. It says, from two years old and under. So they're actually putting time uh, within the, the time that basically that he so found that's out. In, from, okay. Yeah. So, so let's, talk, before we get to that, let's talk about the phrase. He became very enraged. Okay. Um, in the Hebrew, it says, elav ma'od, libo. and it was evil, very much evil to him. Mm -hmm. And he was saddened to his heart was saddened or was saddened to his heart. Mm -hmm. And the Greek has, he became very enraged. It's it's Hebrew has this, this full flowery idiom that the Greek doesn't have. Mm -hmm. and, it, and and I have to ask the question, if he's tran just translating from the Greek, where did he get this full flowery idiom? Here's an example where we can look at Dalich. Mm -hmm. And we can say, okay, Dalich, we know he translated from the uh, Greek into the Hebrew. So how did he translate it? And it might be a small point, but uh, it, it is interesting. It says, and he was very angry. Mm -hmm. He was very enraged in Dalich, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're translating from the Greek, you're probably not going to have this full flowery idiom. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you see this repeatedly happening, mm -hmm. and then here's another one. It says, ma'od." He was uh, very enraged. Uh, this is from a modern Hebrew New Testament, mm -hmm. the Bible Society in Israel, 1976, right? Mm -hmm. So they're translating from the Greek, and they don't have this full flowery idiom. Where did the idiom come from? And this is why Howard, this and other reasons, is why Howard said, hey, wait a minute, this isn't just a translation from the Greek. This might be an original Hebrew composition. I mean, isn't that amazing? Um, it just in a matter of one verse, yeah. with that 16? Yeah. Uh, before we even get to 17, we've got these pearls. <laughs> really? Well, we've got more in 16. Yeah, I mean, that's um, amazing. I don't know how we're going to get to 23. That might be uh, in a future episode. Yeah. Uh, so then in 16, it says in the Greek, and he sent and slew. Mm -hmm. And the Hebrew says something really interesting. It says, and he commanded, and he sent his officers to slay. Yes. I mean, again, if you're translating from the Greek, wh where is all this coming from? Mm -hmm. Right? The uh, modern Hebrew New Testament of the Bible Society has v'shalach laharog, and he sent to kill. Mm -hmm. And Dalich, who's also, we know, translating from the Greek into Hebrew, has um, vaishlach, and he sent, right? And he sent. <laughs> so where is all this verbiage coming from? Uh, I think at the very least we have to say, if you say Hebrew Matthew is a translation, it's not a translation from, from our Greek. Amen. It's a translation from some other text. Amen. From a more primitive text, as Howard called it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Matthew 2.16 from two years and younger, appears in the Greek. Mm -hmm. And I love the last example that we brought in earlier in the verse where it said, they saw, they deceived, and somebody replaced it then with the word they mocked. Mm -hmm. You know, because Howard had hypothesized there was a process of correcting the Hebrew to match the Greek and that I would be able to find the actual manuscript or a manuscript where somebody straight out did this. Mm -hmm. The Hebrew word's there and another scribe comes along and adds above the line, they mocked. So, so we have the same thing happening with the phrase from two years and younger. I was able to find this in 21 manuscripts. 14 of those manuscripts don't have the words from two years and younger. Six of them have from two years and younger. And one of those manuscripts, the last one I looked at, has from two years and younger written above the line. And it's the same one that had uh, the word they mocked written above the line. <laughs> I'm going to have to sit with you quietly at the, in a pool or something and get the name of that name. <laughs> it's golden. Oh, no. <laughs> I, 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 and I understand that people want to see this. I, what I want to do is take all this information and, and publish it in a proper uh, yeah. format. Yeah. Um, and since I uh, went through a lot of effort and yes, 100%. Um, cost to procure this manuscript, I want to do this properly, systematically, and show the corrections to Shame, Home Shame Tones Hebrew Matthew in this manuscript. That'll be a very important study. Mm -hmm. um, can I, can I can, yeah. before you go on, Nehemiah, just about that, 
Uh, one of the reasons that this has been such a long process is that, that one of the things you've said year after year after year after year after year, this has to be done correctly. It has to be done yeah. right. There has to be true text criticism that takes place. Yeah. And you, you're you actually compromising. And I, I want to say this. I, I don't. Please don't take this the wrong way. Um, you're actually um, allowing us to, to look into some of these things without the full, if I can use the word, scholastic scholarly approach can i say that oh or the scholarly procedure let's put it that way the scholarly procedure now this is what i want people to understand that is such a blessing um is that when when you determine yes okay we are going to go begin to look at these there's a whole lot more that needs to be done and that it's a process that you have been working on for years and years and years and years and years but the fact that you're now allowing us and i say this allowing us in in a, a way that has been a blessing to me, because what you've always done, Nehemia, is you've said, listen, here's the key, open the safe, here's where all the information is, but there's so much more that can be done. So that's gonna be done, that's the point, is yeah. that you're gonna take all of these manuscripts, eventually, God willing, and be able to do a live proper uh, process, a, sc- a scholarly process, procedure uh, to do that. Mm-hmm. But the, the fact that we also get these pearls now yeah. gives people a whole lot that they can look at and see. And so I just yeah. wanted to tell you, thanks, for that because you are compromised. I've been begging you and you said, okay, well, maybe there's a compromise and this is the compromise. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you bringing that up. So, so one of the criticisms I've had from some people, um, let's just say within my ministry, which is you can't share this stuff. These are important discoveries. If you don't publish this in a journal article and in, in some, yes. you know, obscure journal article that three people will ever read, someone <laughs> else will, and they'll take credit for the discovery. And I say, okay, I could do that, and I plan on doing that, but that might be 10 years from now. In the meantime, there's people out there who are yearning for this information. Amen. Shouldn't we share it for them? What is the purpose of publishing it in the journal article? To convince the five people who will read these (laughs) obscure articles? Or, Or is it to get the information to the people who need the information and I've made the decision, you know what? I'm gonna share this with the people. Yeah, yeah. And in due time, if it is Yehovah's plan, I will share it in these other formats. Amen. Uh, and through these other procedures where you write it up in a very dry manner and two people uh, blind <laughs> read it and they give you comments. And it's a, it's a process that takes years. Yeah. And, and I think this type of thing is worthy of being shared in that format, mm-hmm. but I also want people to read it and um and be aware of this information mm. and in this case uh, uh hear it and watch it yeah and so i'm i'm sharing what i have right now and it's not perfect it's not polished yeah there's more to be done here guys yeah thank you but, thank uh, you for this is what's opening, available opening. right now and, and i think it's more important to get it out now than wait 20 i mean we have the man who's dying who says i, I want to hear what i can before i die yeah amen amen literally that's a He's blessing dying. that's a blessing all right matthew two sixteen. We're not done with this. Oh, no, I think we are done with this verse. <laughs> so we now have two instances where there's a correction in accordance with the Greek in some of the Hebrew Matthew manuscripts, and there's a single manuscript that I found. By the way, I, as I discovered these manuscripts, uh, Keith, I added, I, you know, Howard called them A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. He got through H, that's eight manuscripts, and then he had this base text, which is the British Library manuscript. I actually call that manuscript Z. Um, I started assigning letters. Okay, he had H, I, J, K, L, M. This manuscript, the one that has the addition above the line, I, and it, it was, you could call it random or you could call it a good incidence. I call it manuscript Q. <laughs> I just noticed that. I'm looking at my notes. What are you talking about? And it says about? manuscript Q that? has it added above the line. <laughs> Listen, folks. Let me just tell you something. I I, I come from I come from a the, the the background of being in a seminary, and there is a star of the show when you talk about the synoptic gospels, meaning these these, these gospel these the, the the accounts of Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke, uh, and John. The gospels. Well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When you compare them and you look yeah. at them together, that's called the synoptic yeah, gospels. Synoptic. So so basically, there's the star of the show is called Q, <laughs> mm-hmm. and he out of just coincidence or good incidents calls this uh, amazing manuscript. They won't tell us where it's from. <laughs> SQ. <laughs> Soon to be revealed. Okay. Um, <laughs> now let's talk about the elephant in the room. Yes. Matthew 2, 17 to 18 talks about this, what's called the slaughter of the innocent. Sorry, you can't do that yet. I can't jump ahead. No, okay. and here's why. Because yeah. in 16, when, when it says, and this mm. is really interesting, uh, at least for me, it was interesting because it refers back to this issue when it, we first hear about in the days of Herod. 
So when it gets to this issue and saying, okay, he's going to, to, to kill all the male children who are in Bethlehem and its borders, one of the things that I did uh, provide, and people can still get this, this is uh, something I want you to, to add to your, your tool chest. I did a, a video, Nehemia, just a really, really mm -hmm. simple, uh, but very powerful video about Herod. And again, the reason why I think it's really important is because if you understand anything about Herod and you get to this verse in 16 now, I'm still at 16. When he says, and he sent, uh, he sent his princes, according to the, uh, to, to, uh, the Hebrew Matthew, uh, to kill all the male children. Um, and you understand something about Herod, this doesn't shock you. It, mm. You understand? I mean, if you, if you understand something about who this person was and, and his history and what he, what he did that we know of 100% for sure, when I read this now, it doesn't shock me. Now, think mm. about that. I mean, yeah. that's, that's who he is. I mean, he's that kind of person. Right. I'm Slaying like people is, is a part of his, is, is, is his DNA, if I can say so that. So there's an irony that he's called Herod the Great. Yeah. Um, when he is considered among the most evil rulers of Israel, that's that certainly of the, of the um, mm -hmm. uh, let's call them Jewish rulers, even though he's, he's an Idume, Idumean, an Edomite. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's definitely considered among the worst rulers. Yes. Like he's up there with Ahab. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Like that tells you something. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, yeah. context on here. Wait, so what's the video that you did? So basically it it's a video it, and, and really I, I would, did some searching because I, I know a lot of people and, and part of the reason we're doing video is that people tend to, there's, there's a lot of people who read and we love the people that read, but there's a lot of people mm -hmm. in the that are, are beginning because of this age. And I'm not sure if it's because of everything with YouTube and whatever, but video is huge. And so what I tried to do is find a video that would be uh, as historically as close historically to accurate as possible, but also engaging. And I found a, a nice video um, that's available at bfainternational.com, right okay. at Hebrew Gospel Pearls oh. that they can watch that will give them okay. background on Herod so that when you're reading and you first hear Herod's name yeah. and again, hear it again, it really, really, really gives you context. And that's important, language, history, and context on who this person is. That's what it is. Well, and, and just to give context of how evil Herod was, he uh, murdered his own son because mm. he was afraid his son would take over as king. And uh, Augustus Caesar famously said, it is better to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. Mm -hmm. And why do you say that? Because as a Jew, or at least sort of a Jew, um, Herod wouldn't slaughter pigs to eat. Uh, and he did slaughter his son. And his wife. And his wife. I mean, he, he, <laughs> he, he committed so many atrocities. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, it, it, it's, he really is, was hated by the Jews, mm -hmm. hated and feared. Mm -hmm. Um, he, uh, ordered his men that on the day of his death, exactly. there would be a massive massacre. Exactly. So that for, cause he knew people would celebrate the day he died mm -hmm. and he wanted people from henceforth for years to come to mourn the day he died. Mm -hmm. So he ordered his soldiers to massacre the Jews on the day of his death mm -hmm. and they refused the order and didn't carry it out. Mm -hmm. But what an evil person. Think about this. Yes. I mean, it, it, it really, what an evil thing to do. And, and the point <laughs> is, like I said, in verse 16, you can't, yeah. like when I read verse 16 now, th to be honest with you, I've read about Herod. I've, I've, I've been in Israel. I've gone to Herodian yeah. and all this sort of things, but, but getting a chance to kind of add some more information, like just visually it, it yeah. helped me. I think it'll help people. Too. Okay. So that's available. All right. So this is a video shared at bfinternational.com. Beautiful. Yep. Yep. Can we read verses 17 and 18 now? hundred percent. Actually, let's start. Let's keep in verse 16. Talk about the slaughter of the innocents, right? So verse 17 and 18 uh, basically tells us that the slaughter of the innocents is a fulfillment of uh, uh, something in, in the book of Jeremiah. But the slaughter of the innocents itself, it's a really interesting chapter in history mm -hmm. because I've been reading a lot of Christian authors on this. There are some Christian authors, Keith, who have no doubt who believe with 100% of their being in the virgin birth. But when it comes to the slaughter of the innocents, they say that's a made up story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I mean, that, that blows my mind right. that, that, that the supernatural event, they have no problem believing, mm -hmm. but this event that it's like, yeah, par for the course for here. That's what we expect. They deny that. And why do they deny it? So the argument goes as follows. And this I think is the predominant view of of, uh, of historians, including many Christian historians, even evangelical historians, mm -hmm. not all, but of many. So the idea is that um, Josephus, who's the Jewish historian who wrote the history, uh, he wrote the antiquities of the Jews, 
and another book called The Jewish War, and he tells the history of Herod in painstaking detail. Mm -hmm. He mentions all kinds of massacres, this massacre and that other massacre, and he mentions nothing in Josephus Mm -hmm. about the slaughter of the innocents in Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. So these historians come along and they say, wait a minute, this must be a made-up story, because if it really happened, Josephus would mention it. Um, Not all historians agree with this. The counter-argument goes as follows. They say, come on, how many people were in Bethlehem to begin with? Let's call it 2,000. That's very generous, right? Let's call it 1,000, 2,000. It's a village. Uh, How many children were there under the age of two, male children, out of 2,000? I don't know what the number is. 50? 20? 30? 50? So Herod killed between 20 and 50 people. That's a day ending in Y for Herod. Right. That might, in other words, their argument is, yeah, Josephus didn't mention that because that's such a common occurrence for Herod to have committed an atrocity like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's important in the history of the New Testament, but in the history of Herod, that's par for the course. That's, you know, he had a bad meal and so he slaughtered that many and people. And isn't that the point, Nehemiah? Again, if you understand about Herod, you understand what you just said isn't really outside of the possibility. That oh, no, that, no- that, it's definitely to be expected. If you had told me that King Josiah ordered the slaughter of the children in Bethlehem, I'd be like, what? That didn't sound like Josiah. If you would have told me John Hyrcanus ordered the slaughter of the children in Bethlehem, I'd be like, really? That, that's a little impl- Herod? <laughs> the guy killed his own son and wife. Like, what are you talking about? Right, right. You know, that, I mean, it, it, it's a day ending in why right. um, for Herod. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's uh, or as we say in Hebrew, every Monday and Thursday. Mm-hmm. Um, so, slaughter of the innocents, whether you accept the, the, the view that it, it, it is historical, not historical. I just, I just find it strange that there's historians, Christian evangelical historians who are willing to believe in the virgin birth, but doubt the slaughter of the innocents. Mm. Like one's supernatural, a, a miracle if you believe in it, and the other is just like normal history for Herod especially. Mm-hmm. Um, now, whether you believe it's historical or not, there is no question whatsoever that this story, and especially the way it's written and described, echoes an event in the life of Moses, specifically the slaughter of the children in Exodus chapter 1. Yes. So if we can, I want to jump to Exodus chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. Yes. Now now again, the, the, the historians who believe this happened will say, yeah, this is a miracle, and God caused the the uh Actions of the children to echo the a- actions of the fathers, Masay Avot Shiman Labanim, that principle that we've talked about. Um, and those who don't believe it's historical will say, yeah, it's made up based on the Moses story, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, the commentator, can't decide on that. Um, I tend to think this did happen. I mean, I don't see any reason to doubt it. Um, Exodus 1 9 to 10. Pharaoh said to his people, uh, Behold, the children of Israel are mighty and more powerful than us. Boy, that that guy had an inferiority complex. Come, let us act wisely with him, meaning with Israel, lest he multiply, and it will happen that uh, that there is a war, and he will be added upon our enemies, and he will fight against us and go up from the land. So what is the reason given for the slaughter of the Israelite children? Because Pharaoh is worried that the Israelites can't be trusted, there'll be a war, And during this time of the war, the Israelites will either turn against the Egyptians or they'll escape and become free. Mm -hmm. So he orders the two midwives to slaughter the children, Mm -hmm. uh, to slaughter the male children, Mm -hmm. and and the two midwives refuse. I'm in. Now, the parallel here is Herod wants to get the um, Magi to help him out, and the Magi refuse. So then Herod turns to his own soldiers. Verse 22, and Pharaoh ordered all of his people saying, now he's not dealing with the Hebrew midwives anymore. He's going to his own men, his own people. Every boy uh, that is born will be cast into the Nile or into the river, and every girl you will save alive, meaning of of the Israelite, of the Hebrew children. So he goes and orders a slaughter of the Hebrew children. Why? Because he's he's worried they're going to attack or they'll escape. Why the males? Because the females weren't soldiers, right? They could control the females, they thought. They couldn't control the males, so let's slaughter the males. That's the reason given in Exodus. Mm -hmm. So far, there's some parallel to the Herod story, but not all that much. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Yes, 100%. It's when you jump to the Jewish legends that were later told about the Moses story, and look, 
I call them legends. Maybe this happened and it just wasn't written in the Tanakh and somebody remembered it and passed it down orally. Or maybe it's a story that was just developed over time. I don't know. But the but this was well known in the first century. That's the important point here. In the first century, when Jews heard the story of Moses, they knew what the biblical account said, and they also knew the legends told around the biblical account. You have in fact, legends. go to most Orthodox Jews today and ask them which part of this is in the text and which part is from the rabbinical or other legends, and they generally won't know the difference. They just know this is what happened with Moses. All right. I'm going to read you from the Targum of Pseudo-Jonathan. It's called Pseudo-Jonathan because it's attributed to Jonathan, um, who uh, was a Jewish uh, author uh, sometime around the contemporary of Rabbi Akiva, uh, so late 1st, early 2nd century. This uh, preserves traditions that were around in the 1st century. Mm -hmm. The translation of Exodus 1.15 First, let's read Exodus 115. Can you read that in your English? Uh, go ahead. I've got four books open and you've got... Okay. Yes. Exodus 115. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, this is NRSV, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua. And then verse 16, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, she shall live. So what the Targum does, the Targum is, a, is an Aramaic translation of the Hebrew, but it's really more than that. The, especially the Targum of Jonathan is... Um, doesn't just translate it. It sometimes it's called a paraphrase, but it's more than a paraphrase in this case. Mm -hmm. It adds a whole story that's not in the, in the text. Mm -hmm. In other words, Pharaoh said to the midwives, and here what jo uh, Jonathan does in the Targum is he gives the reason Pharaoh said this to the midwives. Now, Exodus itself gave a reason. Jonathan gives a different reason. <laughs> Pharaoh said that while sleeping, he was in his dream, Jonathan translates into Aramaic. And behold, all the land of Egypt was on this one scale of a balance, and a young lamb was on the other scale of the balance. And the scale of the balance of the lamb was tipping down. In other words, there's a balance being held. Egypt is on one side, the lamb is on the other side, and the lamb weighs more, tips the balance down. Mm. Now, this is interesting because in the Egyptian way of thinking, when a person died, he went to the afterlife. Mm -hmm. and his soul was weighed in a balance, right? So this is a mm -hmm. very Egyptian idea. Mm -hmm. um, so this is Pharaoh's dream, according to Jonathan, the Targum of Jonathan. Immediately he sent and called all the magicians of Egypt and told them his dream. Immediately Janus and Jambres, the head of the magicians, opened their mouth and said to Pharaoh, a son is about to be born among a congregation of Israel, by whose hand all of the land of Egypt is about to be destroyed. Therefore, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, took counsel and ordered the Jewish midwives, etc. Mm -hmm. So, what the Targum of it's called Pseudo Jonathan, as I mentioned, because it's attributed to Jonathan. We don't know who actually wrote it. Um, Jonathan wrote a Targum on the prophets, and this was mislabeled as being translated by Jonathan. In any event, it does preserve traditions from the first century. And here we have the story that was around in the first century that Pharaoh had a dream that the savior of Israel would be born and that savior is represented by a lamb. <laughs> and the lamb is on a balance and the lamb tips the scales against Pharaoh and against all of Egypt. That little lamb weighs more than all of Egypt, spiritually in the dream. And therefore, okay, let's wipe out all the boys. We don't know which boy is the savior. The assumption was it was a boy. Mm -hmm. We don't know which boy is the savior. Let's kill all the boys. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not the reason Exodus gives, but it was. this is the reason that many Jews believed in the first century, and frankly, most Orthodox Jews today. They'll tell you, why did Pharaoh order the slaughter of the, of, the, of the boys? Because there was a dream. There was a vision. The magicians told him, the Savior of Israel has been born. We've looked upon the stars. Mm -hmm. Okay, are you with me so far? 100%. So, before you go any further, if yeah. you're reading this and you're hearing about this in the first century, whenever it was written, 70 AD, 80, whatever, and you're reading in this whole section, immediately you see this if coming from that perspective. So I was talking with, I was explaining this to T-Bone the other day, mm -hmm. and T-Bone had one of his brilliant insights, which he does. <laughs> we love T-Bone. <laughs> the guy's brilliant. So he says, okay, in the Targum, the sheep is the Israelites. No question about it. Why are the Israelites represented by a sheep in, in, in Pharaoh's vision? Because if you remember back in Genesis, the Israelites were known as shepherds. That's right. And shepherds eat sheep. 
Mm-hmm. And the Egyptians worship sheep as one of their gods. Mm-hmm. And so we're told the, to the Egyptians, a shepherd is an abomination because mm-hmm. they slaughter the Egyptian gods. Mm-hmm. And that's why the Passover sacrifice was a sheep <laughs> to show the Egyptians, we can even kill your God. You're powerless against us. I mean, and we're told the Egyptians wouldn't even eat at the same table as a Hebrew because these Hebrews were uh, shepherds. Mm-hmm. Now, we know about this from Egyptian history, that there was a people called the Hyksos, the shepherd kings, Mm -hmm. who were despised and hated by the Egyptians. So this is actually confirmed in Egyptian sources. Mm -hmm. T-Bone says in his brilliance, okay, to Jonathan, the sheep is Israel. If Matthew knew this story, and I think we have to, I think it seems very plausible, let's put it that way, that Matthew knew this story version of a, of the account. Who is the sheep in Matthew? <laughs> Yeshua. Yeshua. And so the so Pharaoh has a dream. Yeshua or the Messiah, whoever it is, is in a balance against Egypt. Let's kill all the boys to prevent this lamb from coming and being a savior. And then when he retells the story of Yeshua, he uses that same paradigm. It's not to say it didn't happen, but the the, the pieces of information he gives you are definitely patterned after the story of Moses as it was known in the first century to the Jewish multitudes. Let me give you a different version of it, which appears in, um, this appears in Yalkut Shimoni, which is a relatively late collection of, of traditions, but it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's hard to believe that this was not known to Matthew. It says in the 130th year of the Israelites going down to Egypt. Now, remember, in the rabbinical way of thinking, the Israelites were in Egypt 400 years, but that includes Egypt and Canaan. Because mm-hmm. God had said to, uh, to Abram, he had said, your descendants will be a, a strangers in a strange land for 400 years, meaning from the moment that uh, Isaac was born, even though he wasn't in Egypt, he was in somebody else's land before he had inherit it and take in possession of land of Canaan. Okay, so the 130th year of the Israelites coming down uh, to Egypt in the mind of the, of the rabbis is, um, is the, year, um, uh, the year that Moses is born, right? Right. Uh, Pharaoh dreamed and behold, sitting on a th- uh, and behold, he was sitting on his throne and he lifted up his eyes and he saw a certain old man standing in front of him. And in his hand was a scales, the scales of, of merchants meaning like a balance. And the old man took the scales and he uh, hung them before Pharaoh, meaning he lifted them up, hanging them. And he took all the elders of Egypt and its officers and its great ones. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see. And he put them in the balance, in one side of the balance. And afterwards he took a young milk lamb, meaning a a young baby uh, uh, sheep, that's still milking at its mother's um, teat. And he put it in the other balance. And the balance of the lamb overcame all of them. And Pharaoh was stunned at this, vi- at this terrible vision. Why is it that the lamb overcame everybody else? Right? It didn't make sense to him. This lamb is all of Egypt. Mm-hmm. And Pharaoh woke up and behold, it was a dream. And he woke up early in the morning and he called all of his servants and he told them the dream. And the people had a very great fear. And one of the office or one of the eunuchs of the eunuchs of the king answered, "Um, this is none other than great evil, which will grow out of Egypt in the latter days. That's interesting. He says in the latter days Mm -hmm. for a child will be born from Israel and he will destroy all the land of Egypt. If it is good to the king, let the word go forth from the presence of the king and let it be written in the laws of the king that every male of the Hebrews that is born will be killed in order that this evil will be prevented from the land of Egypt. And the king did so. Now, the the parallel to to the story of the slaughter of the innocents is 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 uncanny. Now, Herod didn't have a dream, but he had magicians come to him, Magi, right? And we've heard about uh, Janus and Jambres are mentioned by name, who are the chief of the magicians. They're telling the king, you got to kill all the boys. Um, there's another tradition that appears in the Talmud, and it's very interesting. It's based on Numbers chapter 20, verses 7 to 13, where it talks about the waters of contention. Mm-hmm. This is where Moses struck the rock. Mm-hmm. Now, the Talmud in the discussion there 
is talking about astrology and magic. And the rabbis have a very interesting view. They say, you know, astrologers, it's not all made up. Astrologers and magicians see things that are true. They just don't have all the truth. And then they bring the example of the astrologers who told Pharaoh that the Savior would be born to Israel. And the astrologers saw that, here, I'll read what it says. So the phrase in in Numbers 20 is, those are the waters of contention. And it's kind of a strange phrase. What do you mean, those are the waters of contention? Right? It's, It's telling the reader in the book of Numbers, the waters of contention that you know about, this is what happened. Moses struck the rock instead of talking to to, uh, the rock. The rabbis say, why would it say those are the waters of contention? They're clearly already known. So it explains in the Talmud, those which the astrologers of Pharaoh saw, but erred. Mm -hmm. They saw that the downfall of the Savior of Israel would be caused by water. And so they decreed, cast every son who was born into the Nile. But they did not understand the downfall of Moses would be due to the waters of contention where Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to it. Mm -hmm. So we have here three different versions, three slightly different versions, but three essentially witnesses of this belief that there were astrologers who foretold a savior would be born in Egypt. And that's the real reason, not what we're told in Exodus, but that's the real reason why it was the males who were ordered to be killed. And look, maybe both are true. I don't know. There's no question this was known in my mind, there's no question this was known to Matthew. Uh, it was probably known to Herod as well. Mm-hmm. Herod sees these astrologers coming and he's like, ooh, I know there's a way of stopping this. I'm going to do it, what Pharaoh did. Mm-hmm. And of course, it didn't work for Pharaoh. It didn't work for Herod. <laughs> wow. And then do we, do we get to move on to the, to the, to the verse? In yeah, the... That, that's what I got. Um, well, okay, I want to talk about Matthew 2.18. Ooh, wow. There's a lot more to bring here. Yeah. Um, We're already I, at, well, we have Yeah, a, can we save this for the plus episode? Well, here we have I got, a controversy, I got so much folks. More to bring here. If you're listening, th- th- this is a bit of a controversy. Nehemiah and I, uh, I, want to, I want to read something, Nehemiah. Uh, we're mm-hmm. about to, we're, we're, we are going to transition. And the reason for that is, one, we said we were going to try to do 50 minutes to an hour. Uh, we're, at, we're just about at that time. But this morning, I received an email, Nehemi, and I'd like to, to with your permission, to, to share it sure. uh, here. And um, the reason I want to share this email is that uh, it addresses something that is quite important for us. But hey, now before need... you share that email, I just want to remind people, so what we're doing in each episode of the Hebrew Gospel Pearls is we're doing the main episode. It goes out as a podcast, goes out on YouTube. Everybody can listen to it. And then we're going even in more depth in what we're calling Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is we're alternating because there's two ministries involved. Uh, One week it's going to be on Keith's website, the Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. The other week it'll be on my website. And I'm making it available to what I call my support team. Those are people who support my ministry, who want to go in more depth. And for me, this is a way of saying thank you for supporting my ministry. And actually, uh, by the way, Nehemia, I I know you talked about this at the beginning. Uh, You've got something that's really... (laughs) It's a game changer. We are going to go to the plus section, but I got this email and my heart was was moved and I, I need to share this email from someone. And what he says is, did you ask the father before making gospel pearls? And then he uses the word for sale. He says, dear wow. Keith, I'm bringing the truth in the Philippines now as a reply from many of my friends. They come sadly to me telling me that they simply can't get the information they need is there are two obstacles. Their daily income is less than four USD and they don't have a credit card. Looks like the decision, and he uses the word he says, of selling information is blocking some thousands of Filipinos uh, outside the source of this life-changing revealing. So what we did is we reached out to this this man, and he actually has a ministry there. And immediately, Karen, the administrator of BFA, said, listen, let's start over again. Let's give you access to this information. And so that was, was taken care of. And then she said, listen, we have a whole lot of information for people that takes no credit card. It doesn't take anything. They register as a free member. Even if you're not registered as a free member, there's so much information. But Nehemia, the reason that this was a bit of a challenge when I first got it, now it ended up being a blessing because he came back and he said, you know what? He says, Shalom. Now, after sending a message this morning, I was ashamed. I had two hard words. I asked forgiveness for my behavior, 
I was just so frustrated after hearing the opinions of complaints of our believer friends there. And he's talking about all the studying that's taking place and all the people. And he basically was saying, listen, you know, we, we've got to find a way to get this information to people. And immediately Karen sends this message. And please bear with me, you all, because this, this was important. She says, I understand your situation and your frustration. We would be very happy to give you a complimentary premium content membership. Please go to, and she explains them how to do this. Now, Nehemia, we've only had a few people, say a few. A few? Only a few people who have, have complained about this Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. And every mm -hmm. person that has complained, uh, we've done the same thing, which is, listen, let's find some common ground, what it is that we're trying to do. Nehemia, you brought up just a few minutes ago in this, in this conversation about what you've paid for, for manuscripts, the travel, all of the issues that have taken place. And I wish that everything that we did was free. <laughs> Mm -hmm. but it's not. And the truth of the matter is, is what we're really trying to do. And I love the way you say it is to say, thank you to those of you that helped us to provide the information from our friends in the Philippines. I had another phone call from a man in Mexico. He hears about this. He's excited. We're providing the information. People around the world are learning about this. And I want to say to those of us, those that are, have, have responded at, and, and become a support team members and premium mm -hmm. content library members, you are helping us get this information around the world. So mm -hmm. there are challenges. This is something sure. that's new and it's different, but it's working. So I want to say thank you to everybody for that. Yeah. And of course, as we go to the plus section, you're going to go to bfainternational.com. You'll become a premium member. You'll have access to Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus, plus a whole bunch more. We are raising the bar in terms of what you get as a premium um, member. But I, I want to say, Nehemia, the challenge was when this first came, I, I got a little nervous because I know we have people around the world who literally can't afford $9.99. But guess what? We've been able to get them that information. So we're going to continue doing this until we stop. And basically, the process is simple. We're providing a whole bunch of information free. You don't have to do anything. But for those of you that are premium content members at BFA International, you get access to everything, including Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus. Anything you'd like to say, sir? Yeah, so in, in, I, I can just speak for my ministry, McCore Hebrew Foundation, that when people contact us and say, hey, I, I want to be a get access to the support team studies, but I, I can't afford anything, um, you know, what we'd say is, okay, would you pray for the ministry? Mm -hmm. And usually the response is, oh, I pray for your ministry every day. Okay, if you're, if you're supporting us through prayer and that's all you can afford to do, then we're not going to deny you the access to the information. And again, I think that's the beauty of this, Nehemia. The information really is, is, is this is, this is life-changing information, and we're not trying to keep it from, we are, we are trying to say thank you to those of you that have responded. And I hope that every single person here, because you're about to share some information, I know you, you can't, I, I haven't heard it, folks. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to the plus section myself, <laughs> and I'm going to be sitting and waiting to hear this, Nehemia. I mean, are you ready to, to, to share this information? I'm really excited. I'm ready. Okay, well, let's do it. Can I pray first? I'm just looking to make sure I have enough coffee. Okay. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for uh, the idea, the inspiration. Thank you for those that are, are wanting the information, Father. Thank you that we found a way to do it. Thank you for our supporters who go above and beyond the call of duty to help uh, give people access around the world to the information that's changing their life. Thank you so much for what we've done so far. And we do give this process to you. We have prayed, we have asked you, and we will continue to do that. Lead us and guide us, whether we turn to the left or to the right, May we hear the voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, and we will respond. Amen, Yehovah. Please be with all those who, who want the information and guide them to this information, mm -hmm. to whatever information that is that they need. Yes. Yehovah, give us the wisdom to continue to put out these teachings and um, speak only truth that glorifies and honors your name. Amen. Amen. You have been listening to Hebrew Gospel Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. For a more in-depth study, check out Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus at NehemiasWall.com and BFAInternational.com. Thank you for your support. <laughs>